This last Sunday was Pentecost Sunday, and I had it on my heart that we want to talk today about things that I've talked about in the past, but I want to make sure we have it in our hearts and we have it in a teaching that somebody can get online and really listen to it. So it's for today, but it's just not for today. It's for you, but it's just not for you. It's for those that are here, but also those that might be listening online, or, or you can direct them there if they have questions. So what happened on the day of Pentecost? I, I'm going to read for a while, and then Arch is already ready. He's told me he will read for me. He begged me and begged me, and finally I said, okay. He said, as long as you don't tease me. And I said, well, that's an impossibility. So he said, all right, I'll take it. But if, you, if you'll put up Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. It says, for as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most assuredly believed among us. He, Luke is writing, he says, uh, there's some things that we all really believe, and, and others have written about it, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses. He says, people talk to us, uh, they're eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding. It, it's, very understand, it's very important that we see this. It says, perfect understanding. So he's writing, Luke is, and he's saying, I had perfect understanding of things that happened from the beginning on, of all things from the very first. He's talking about the first when Jesus Christ came into the world. Uh, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus. Now the word Theophilus, some have thought is just a greeting, and it could be just a greeting, but it means things like loved, uh, the one who's loved by God, or it means things like the one who is a friend of God. Uh, some believe, and I'm just telling you what some believe, uh, you look up in commentaries and you'd find some would say it was a Roman officer, a military officer. Uh, some would say, no, it's not a military officer, it's a high-ranking official in the Roman government that he's writing to. Others would say, no, he's actually who he's writing to his own lawyer. Uh, his lawyer would have to be a Gentile to represent him in Rome, and so he's now writing to his lawyer. Uh, others would say that it's the high priest, and there's reasons to believe. Uh, it could be Caiaphas' uh, son-in-law, and so uh, uh, people believe that could be him. Uh, so Theophilus is an important thing to know that he's writing this, but I, I, I don't believe it's just a greeting. I believe it is an individual. But to be quite frank and honest, there's no one who can tell you for sure. Some will act like they can, but there's, there's just not enough uh, information. Though there's a lot of information that it has to, probably was a Gentile because he's writing to try to explain it to Gentiles who don't understand the things that some of the Jews do. So now we just read that, and that was talking, he was writing to him, and now he says, I have perfect understanding, but it started at the beginning and also all the way to the end. And now in Luke 24, and then verse 49. We want to go to Luke. Hey, how you doing? It says Luke 24, verse 49. Uh, we want to read, it says this, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. Now this is Jesus Christ speaking. Listen to what he says. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endured, endued with power from on high. So Jesus is telling them, I want you to go to Jerusalem, and I want you to stay there until you be endued with power from on high. Now, this is written uh, in Luke, the one who said, I have a perfect understanding from the beginning all the way till now. And he writes that this is what Jesus said. Now, in Acts chapter 1, again, this is, this is almost like a class today uh, where you could really get information and back up what you, uh, if you're someone who believes in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Or if you're somebody who's searching and you need to know, is it real and is there tongues involved? We're going to look at it today. We're going to go scripture for scripture. Of, the Bible says uh, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. That's how you build something. So we're going precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. And we're going to lay a, a case as though we were in court. And uh, right now he says, and behold, I send a promise of my father unto you, but tarry ye in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. So we know that the promise is going to bring power. Now in Acts chapter 1, we're going to be looking at verse 5 and verse 8, and then also verses 12 through verse 15. For those of you taking notes, that's why I'm reading it that way. For the, those of you that aren't taking notes, you wonder why I'll stop and give them a moment. Because when they're writing something down, they want to, they want to try to remember it. So it's Acts chapter 1, verses 5 and ver, uh, verse 8. And then Acts chapter 1, verses 12 through 15. 
So we're going to start with Acts chapter 1 and verse 1. It says, the former uh, treatise have I made, O Theophilus. There's that name again. So it's the same writer writing here that wrote over in Luke. He says, the former uh, treatise have I, or the former book I've wrote unto you, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. He said, I started writing to you in the Gospel of Luke how Jesus began to do some things. Uh, I want you to know Jesus isn't done yet. Now, he's going on to be with the Father and set at the right hand, but we're his body on this earth, so he's still doing stuff. Amen? Until, and it goes, until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto his apostles whom he had chosen. He said, before he was taken up, he did give some stuff to his apostles. And then he's going to talk to you about it in verse 3. To whom also he showed himself alive. Remember, he was dead. He rose, and he shows himself to his apostles and to other people. And he also told his apostles some, he, they say here, commandments or truths being taught. Uh, verse 3 again. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days. So Jesus, after he rose from the dead, was walking on this earth, would show up and talk to his apostles, would, would show them things, and be over 500 people saw Jesus after he had rose from the dead. So for 40 days he was here on this earth. Uh, there's no way those living at that time could really have a good case saying that he didn't raise from the dead because there's 500 people that said, yeah, we saw him. And again it says um, in verse 3 once again, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion for many infallible proofs being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things per pertaining to the kingdom of God and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. And verse 5 says, For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. See, there, there, there's a difference. He says, John baptized with water, but you're going to be baptized with the Holy Ghost. So go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise, which is the Holy Ghost. Now in Acts chapter 1, same chapter, verse 8, we just drop down a little bit, and it says, and you shall receive power. Everybody say power. power. And Jesus is saying something that we, we don't want to discount. He says, and you shall receive power. He said, but, but, but I don't really believe it. This is Jesus. We better believe it. And you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come up on you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and unto all the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, so he says, hey, look, I want you to go to Jerusalem. They go there. They go to the upper room, if you remember. And he says, I want you to stay there until the Holy Ghost comes. It's a promise from my Father. And he'll come, and when he comes, he'll undo you with power. Remember, Peter's kind of wishy-washy. He's, af he's afraid. The night that Jesus is taken, uh, he denies Jesus, uh, that, that even follower of Jesus, because he's afraid. Now watch what happens when he's endued with power. But first, let's go ahead and read uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 12. We're going to read down through 15. And the reason we're going to read this is because I want you to see how many people are in that upper room. Because some people say the only people that are ever supposed to be baptized or filled with the Holy Spirit are the apostles. So we want to take a moment and read what the Bible says. Everybody say what the Bible says. The Bible says. See, we all have opinions. We all have noses. And we, we all sometimes have larger noses than others. And we all, sometimes our noses can smell more than others. So opinions are like that. We all have one, but some smell more than others. So we ought to go to the Bible and let the Bible speak for the Bible. Amen? Or you could say it this way, let the Bible speak for God. Or you could say it this way, since the Bible is God's word, let God speak for God. So now let's go ahead. It said, they returned, in verse 12, Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey. That's not very far. I've been on the Mount of Olives, and I've walked into Jerusalem. It's not very far at all, because it says here a Sabbath day's journey, because on the Sabbath day, if you remember, they're not supposed to do a lot of work. They're not supposed to exert a lot of energy. So you, uh, the Mount of Olives, you stand and you can look right in the gates of Jerusalem and, and you can walk right there. So it's not very far. So it says, and when they had, were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew and Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Atheus and Simon the Zealots and Judas the brother of J James. Now, James is a half-brother of Jesus. 
So watch that. It says the brother of James. So that would be another brother of Jesus. See, Judas, the one Judas betrayed Jesus. The other Judas was actually uh, Jesus' half-brother. It goes on, verse 14. These all continued with one accord in prayer. Remember, we always talk about how we should be uh, in unity, uh, all praying and, and agreeing together, because there's power in unity. You know, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women. Now watch this, uh, ladies, if you're here, it wasn't just 12 men. With the women. And Mary, the mother of Jesus. Jesus' mother was there and with his brethren. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of names together were about what? Were about 120. So in the upper room, meeting on a consistent basis was 120 people coming together. Mary's mom, uh, I mean Jesus' mom, Mary, uh, his half-brothers, and others. Uh, his op other apostles, they were all up there, and other people were up there. Up to 120 people were up there in one accord praying. And then this is what, what happens in uh, Acts 2, starting with verse 1. We're going through verse 4. It says, And when the day of Pentecost... That's uh, what we just celebrated this last Sunday around the world for Christianity. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they all were in one accord in one place. So we know they were all. Everybody say all. all. Not some of them, but they were all. They were all. That's okay, 120. And they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly, and a lot of times you're waiting and waiting and waiting, and God moves suddenly. You know, you go, when, when's it going to, when's it going to happen? When's it going to happen? He just moves suddenly. You go, wow, that happened fast. And you've been waiting for a while, but God just moves. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared upon them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it set upon each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And began to speak with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I want you to notice verse 4 up there, if you would, please. It says, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So, in other words, the Spirit didn't take their mouth and move their mouth. They spoke as the Spirit gave them utterance. And a lot of times people say, I want to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and they're waiting for God to grab their mouth. And No, no, you start working your mouth. You speak, and God will speak out of your mouth. Amen? For instance, tonight, God laid something in my heart to teach tonight. I could stand up here and wait for God to open my mouth, or I could just start opening my mouth and let God fill it. Amen? Amen. Okay, so they spake, but the Holy Spirit was there. Now, what I would like to do, what we just saw is when the Holy Spirit came and brought power, the baptism, or the infilling of the Holy Spirit came, we saw the sign was tongues. Didn't we just see that? So, so there's tongues. They all spoke in, in other languages. So now we're going to take a look at is that normal or was that just odd for that time or, or that upper room? Was it just for the apostles and the a hundred and some that were with them? Well, let's take a look, and I'm going to do some reading tonight. And again, Archer's going to help me if I get tired. I want you to have this. I want you to see that this is not some flippant or silly teaching that we do. This is the Bible, and a lot of people don't go into as much detail, and then they make fun of something like this. We're going into detail so we can stand on the Word. Amen? Amen. So now we're going to take a look at the next time there's a baptism or infilling of the Holy Spirit. We're going over to Acts chapter 8. And verse 1. I remember so many years ago when I just had given my heart to the Lord and came into these things, I spent hours and hours, and I mean hours and hours, going through the Bible over and over and over and over and over again. Because the church I had gone to said that uh, being uh, baptized in the Holy Spirit or speaking in tongues was of the devil. And I didn't want the devil. I wanted all the God I, I could get. I already knew the devil. I'd worked for him for a long time. I wanted to give my life to the Lord. And so I was hungry for God. And so I went over and over and over and over and over and over this. So if anybody knows these scriptures, I'm sure others know them better, but I definitely know them because I had to convince myself, I asked the Lord to help me, and, and finally I, I, I just have it. I mean, I had it, and, and thank God I was, I was confident that the Bible is true. Amen? Amen? So over here in Acts chapter 8, verse 1 says, And Saul, now Saul becomes Paul, if you remember, and becomes one of the greatest apostles there ever was, wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, but before he became Paul, his name was Saul. 
And Saul was just trouble for the church. The new the Christians, the believers that were on the earth, just had a hard time with Saul because Saul was just taking them to prison and, and, and separating families. He was just not a nice guy. Like it says here in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, it says, And Saul was consenting unto his death. Stephen had just been stoned, and Saul was standing there. They laid their coats. The people that stoned him laid their coats at Saul's feet. And it says he sat there and he said, Yes, he deserves to be killed. He's a heretic because he's talking about that guy named Jesus. And Saul was consenting unto his, de unto his death, that's Stephen. And at that time there was a great persecution uh, against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Now what's funny here is Jesus told them to go in all the world and preach the gospel. But they didn't do it at first. But when persecution came, then all of a sudden they went out and started preaching the gospel everywhere. It says here in devout, in verse 2, and devout men carried uh, Stephen, I'm sorry, it was Stephen, I said, I said the wrong name. Stephen is the guy that had been killed. Uh, uh, Stephen to his burial and made great lamentations over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. He took them in went right into their house, grabbed them, pulled them out of their... Can you imagine you're in your house having supper or dinner or lunch, and they grab you, pull you out of the house, and throw you in prison? That was, he was in charge of that, Saul was, who later became Paul. Therefore, they were scattered abroad, went everywhere, preaching the Word. They didn't hide. They went around preaching the Word of God. Then Philip went down. Now, here we go to Philip. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria. This is important. Remember Jesus talked to the woman at the well. Uh, she was a Samaritan. Uh, if you remember, Jesus talks about the good Samaritan, or we call him the good Samaritan. Um, uh, Samaritan is a half-breed. It's half Jew and half not Jew. And uh, the Jews didn't like him. The Jews, if they had to walk, say, over there, they would walk around the Samaritan's town because they said if you stood or touched the ground, uh, you get filthy and unclean. The Jews didn't like the Samaritans, and the Samaritans didn't really like the Jews. And that's why the story of the Good Samaritan is so powerful, because the, the man who was laying alongside the road who the Samaritan helped was a Jew. So this is very, uh, uh, very important that now this gospel, this thing, uh, is going to be talked about is for, to, for the Samaritans, the unclean, or the ones the Jews don't like. Uh, it says, then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached the gospel unto them. You got to know the Jews didn't like that. You're going to the Samaritans and preaching Christ, Jesus Christ. The, the Jewish believers did not like this Philip going down there and preaching Jesus to those filthy Samaritans. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them, and many were taken with palsy, and that were lame were healed. Uh, he goes down there, Stephen does, and he starts talking to them about Jesus Christ. And all of a sudden, spirits are being cast out, and people are being healed. Isn't it interesting how people say, no, the gospel doesn't uh, have any power in it. You, you can't cast out devils. You can't heal people. You can't pray for those, those that are sick. But the early church, they just didn't know that. They thought it did, so they did it. And many uh, were taken with palsy, and that were lame were healed. And there was a great joy in that city. Can you imagine your city, the Samaritan city? You're hearing about this Jesus Christ who was a Jew. This Jew is preaching it to you, Philip. And pe your mama and your daddy are being healed. Your, your kids are being healed. You're going, wow, this is fantastic. Uh, but there was a certain man called Simon, uh, which before time... Now, this is important. That's why I'm reading through this. Watch this. Which before time, in the same city, used sorcery. There's always different powers out there, different spirits out there. There's a con. There's an evil spirit. The devil tries to make himself look like, Satan, or look like Jesus or make, look like God. And so you have to always be careful. Amen? Amen? The city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that he himself was some great one. Uh, he was nothing but a con man. To whom they all gave heed for the least to the greatest, saying, this man... Is, is the great power of God. This Simon did all these kind of uh, weird things and con man. And they said, wow, we're going to follow him. He's got to be from God. But now this guy has come down. This guy's talking about Jesus. And he's casting demons out of people and healing people. And now the whole city's going, what is going on? This is cool. 
But now going back to Simon, this con guy, and to him they had regard. They had really given regard to this con man because that of a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. Um, but when they believed Philip's preaching, the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women. Although men said amen. amen. And all the women said amen. amen. That means we all can make heaven. Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and the signs which were done. He's continuing. He's watching this. and He's going, how can this happen? I'm a con guy, but it looks like this is for real. Now when the apostles, which are at Jerusalem, everybody say the apostles. If you remember, up, uh, we read it a minute ago. I don't know if you caught it or not. Maybe I didn't bring enough attention to it. It said the church was scattered except for the apostles. It said the apostles stayed in Jerusalem. So they're up there in Jerusalem. Uh, he's down there preaching the gospel, and things are happening among the Samaritans. Now, the apostles are who everybody, who everybody looks to to see if they'll put their stamp of approval on things. And if they reject the Samaritans, then the Samaritans are rejected. But if they put their stamp of approval that what is going on down there is of God, then the Samaritans now can be brought into the kingdom of God. This is very important because what's going to happen is they're going to go down there and check everything out. And they're going to decide on whether uh, half-breeds can come into the kingdom of God. And if you have different nationalities in your blood, let's pray that it happens because we all want to be saved. Amen? And so that's what happens. The apostles... No one's going to believe it unless the apostles put the stamp of approval. So the apostles have to go down and see whether it's right or not. It says, when they were came down, in verse 15, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Did you just hear that? They came down to Samaria. They've been hearing all these things are taking place. And now they pray for them to have the Holy Ghost. They already, we already know that people are being baptized. That means they believed. They believed. They received Jesus Christ and they were baptized. Baptism is an outward expression of an inward decision that was made. They were baptized. But now the apostles come down that they might receive the Holy Ghost for as of yet he was fallen upon none of them. Only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Some people say, well I've got all there is. I, was, I, I, I received Jesus Christ and I was water baptized. Well again the apostles went down there and, and, and came down there so they could receive the Holy Ghost. They had received Jesus Christ, but there's a different thing going on here. Everybody say different. different. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them, only that they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. So now the apostles come down. Uh, are you all Italian or mixed? You're all Italian? How about you? Uh, are you mixed? Are you one? One or other? I'll lay my stance on myself. <laughs> but my grandpa said, what was it, Mom? We are a whole lot of... Uh, we're a whole lot of nothing. Uh, I don't know how you say it. I, yeah, we're a little bit of everything, but not much of anything. We have all kinds of us. He, they went down there, and they looked at the Samaritans, and this is important. My, I'm telling you, this is huge what's going to take place here. This is whether God's really going to accept them or not. This is huge, huge. And they walk over, and he, they lay their hands on them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. This is huge. And the apostles, others are watching to see, is God going to accept them or not? It looks like the apostles are saying okay because they're putting their hands on them. But what's going to happen? And let's read on. I think we'll, we'll see something. At least we'll, we'll put it together as detectives. We'll figure this out. And when they were come down, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. As of yet, they had fallen on none of them, only that they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw, everybody say, the con man saw. Amen. Now please understand, if you're a con man, say Arch is a con man. He's not. He's a very good man. But let's say he is. And, and I go over and I lay my hands here. And I say, Carl, receive the Holy Ghost. And all he sees is this. Me putting my hand on him, and that's how he receives the Holy Ghost. There's no way he's going to pay me money to have that gift. Because he could just fake it. Amen? Yes. You understand what I'm saying? So something has to happen. So he's willing to pay me to have the power to have him get the Holy Ghost. So I put it to you. There has to be a sign that he saw he wanted to pay to be able to have that power. And I would say it's the speaking in tongues. Amen? 
Now watch what I mean by that. He laid their hands, and verse 17 says, Then they laid their hands on them that they may receive the Holy Ghost. Now watch verse 18. And when Simon saw through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money. Now listen to what he's going to offer them money for. Saying, Give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay my hands he might receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Okay, this was the second time we saw uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Oh, it doesn't say they spoke in tongues, but it says that this guy saw something take place, and he's willing to pay me to give him the power to lay hands on other people also, so they might be filled with the Holy Ghost. He would not, as a con man, pay me if all I did was this. There had to be a sign that followed. Amen? Amen. Okay, let's, let's go on. Let's go to Acts chapter uh, 9, verse 10 through 17. I'm going to ask you to start to read that, uh, Arch, if you would, please. You can read it right off the overhead if you'd like. That way you don't have to keep looking down and up, if that helps you. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. Okay, I'm going to ask you to hold on for a minute. This is important. Remember the half-breeds we talked about, the Samaritans? They were half Jew and half something else? Now what's going to happen is now it's no Jew, Jewish blood. They're totally Gentile. So you could say, well, God allowed the Samaritans because they had some Jewish blood. But now they're going to totally non-Jews. No Jewish blood. No blood of, of the Jews in them at all. So it's not half part or a little portion of Jewish blood. They're totally Gentiles. Okay? So watch. The gospel is trying to tell us it came to the Jews, it went to Samaria, which the half-breeds had some Jewish blood, and then it went to those who had no Jewish blood at all. Now if you have Jewish blood in you, that's good. But guess what? If you don't have any Jewish blood in you, this is for us. Amen? Okay, can go ahead if you would, please. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of now, this Jesus. this is interesting also. I'm going to keep interrupting you. Just get used to it. Pretend I'm your wife. You'll be, you know. <laughs> 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 Okay, Saul, what this is talking about is Saul has had a Damascus Road encounter with Jesus Christ. He, he all of a sudden can't see now because there's scales on his eyes. And he goes into this town, and I think it's funny. He goes to this house. God says, go to that place. He goes there. He's led there, and they put him in a house. And now Saul is the one who's been causing all the problems. He's been going into your house, house, Carl, house, Carl, pulling Amy out and separating you and your wife. And he's causing problems like that. And now God deals with him, or Jesus actually visits him and says, now I want you to go over there and sit there. I'm going to send somebody. So he's over there setting, and the street that he's setting on is called straight. God's going to straighten him out. Amen. Yeah, you hear me? He's on, he's on the street called straight. God's going to straighten him out. Man, and all of us at times have been straightened out by God. But go ahead if you would, please. By the way, I thought the air conditioner was working. Are you guys cool enough? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, good. Okay. <coughs> and had seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard my, by many of this man how much evil he had done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he had authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Now hold on, I don't know if we missed the verse or I just missed it, but what happens is the Lord speaks to Ananias and says, there's a guy over there on State Street, on Straight Street, and you need, to go, you need to go talk to him so he can receive his sight and see things he doesn't see right now. Understand the gospel better. than It's just not a physical thing that's going to happen. It's a spiritual thing. He's going to see things he never saw in the natural. So he's going to, I mean, in the spiritual realm before. His eyes are going to open up. His uh, natural eyes, but also spiritual eyes are going to open up when uh, he comes and lays hands on him. And God tells Ananias, go lay your hands. And Ananias is saying... 
I heard about this guy. My relatives were hurt. My uncle was hurt. My mother was separated. You think I'm going to go over there and talk to him? But go ahead. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Now, uh, this is important because this is the beginning of talking about Saul, who becomes Paul. Paul becomes the apostle to the Gentiles. And it's interesting, right here it says, he's a chosen vessel unto me to hear my name, or to, to bear my name before the Gentiles. If you're a Gentile, say, thank God. Thank God. Yeah. Okay? And kings and the children of Israel. Go ahead. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Now, while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were lodged there. While Peter thought on the vision... Wait, wait, wait. I don't know what happened back there, but let me read it. Acts 9, verse 16. Acts 9, verse 16. 16. For I show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Verse 17. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands, maybe the house on Straight Street, and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee on the way as thou cameth, has sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight. That's a, a thing on two ways, physical and spiritual sight, and be filled with the Holy Ghost. This is another reference to somebody being filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen? Amen. Now, it does not say, once again, that Paul, hands were laid on Paul or Saul, and he started speaking in tongues. But let me give you two scriptures that I think kind of make sure that we know that happened because of 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 18. This is the apostle Paul now, not Saul. Same guy, but now he's Paul. He writes, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. So he's saying, I thank God that I speak with tongues more than you all. And I would say it took place when hands were laid on him. The Holy Ghost came up on him just like the day of Pentecost. And, and some have said this. So we're trying to make sure we... we uh, are an apologist for the Bible. We're, we're coming against those who, who try to twist things. Some have said, no, he says he speaks in tongues more than everyone because he's educated. And so he speaks Spanish and German and this and that. Well, here, look at verse 14. 1 Corinthians 14 and 14 says this. Again, it's Paul writing. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. He's saying, if I pray in an unknown tongue, I, my mind doesn't know what the heck I'm talking about. So it isn't because he's smarter and he knows other languages. It's because he's praying in a language that is unknown even to his own mind. Amen? Amen. So uh, we need to get that because people will play that game on us and, and we'll, get, we'll get sucked into that. For I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. Verse 15, what is it then? I will pray in the spirit and I will also pray with the understanding also. He says, I'll pray in tongues, or I'll pray in my understanding also. I will sing in the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. It's like this. Heavenly Father, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I ask you to bless this. I have no idea what I just prayed. That's tongues. Uh, Heavenly Father, I ask you to wake people up that are falling asleep. And I ask you, Father God, to jolt them with your Holy Spirit and get your power come into this room. Okay, I'm praying in the understanding, and I'm praying in the Spirit. Amen. Now, I would sing in the understanding and sing in the Spirit, but I love you too much for that. So we see here that Paul, when he had that thing, when, when Ananias comes in and lays his hands on him, his eyes, his natural eyes, the scales fall off, his spiritual eyes sees things, and he is filled with the Holy Ghost. And later he says, I speak in tongues more than you all. I need to pray, pray a whole lot. Uh, my pastor was Pastor Summerall back in Indiana, and 
If you were walking down the hallway, the assistants to him would tell me this. If you were walking down the hallway and he didn't know you were in back of him, he would be walking along the, the hall, going to his office, praying in tongues the whole way. They say, you ever wonder why Brother Summer is so powerful? He prays in tongues all the time. We catch him praying in tongues. So we need to pray in tongues. Amen. Amen. But now, that was the, that was Samaritans, Jews, someone who is a terrible person coming against God, and yet God turns it around, uses them, and fills them with the Spirit. But now let's go over to Acts 10, verse 1. And there's a whole lot, I know we're reading a lot, but we have to do this because we're, we're building a case to make sure it's legitimate. Uh, I don't like it when, when you have a one verse wonders and they give you one verse and then you wonder what they're talking about. Yeah, one verse wonders. They give you one verse, you wonder what they just said or wonder if it's true or not. So what we want to do is we want to give a lot of verses and see that it's true. Okay, there was a, in verse 1. Are, do you have the right scripture? Yeah. Okay, Acts 10 verse 1. There was a certain man in uh, Caesarea called Cornelius. A, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. Uh, they played the drums and the. F a devout man and one that feared God with all of his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius, and when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms have come up for a memorial before me. We're getting ready to go into Memorial Day. Yeah, you can have a memorial unto God by helping people, blessing them, and praying. And now uh, send men to Joppa and call on one Simon, whose surname is Peter. If you guys, ever, if you guys know who Peter is in the Bible, say, I know. Okay, so do I. It says, and he uh, lodgeth with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. I was there, by the way. And this is an interesting place. Right by the seashore, you go, you know, when you hear about Peter being there, and he goes upstairs, if you remember, and the, the sheet is, comes down, and he sees the different animals and all that. He says, eat. He says, I don't eat anything unclean. You remember that story? Yeah. Well, I'm telling you what. You think he's working hard, but when you go to the top of that, that house and you look out, across, it's right by the sea. I mean, you're sitting there with a the breeze flowing by. You're looking at the beautiful waves. You're going, he had it kind of nice up there. Really, truly. And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. He said, man, I had a vision, and the vision, the angel told me to send you to Joppa to this guy's house and ask for Simon, Simon Peter. And it says, and, and this guy is totally a, 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 not, not a Jew at all. And the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew high, uh, nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the ninth hour. It's a beautiful place. And he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell asleep into a trance. He saw heaven open and a certain vessel descending unto him, as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth. Wherein were all the manner of four footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And there came a voice uh, to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. The Jews were not supposed to eat certain items. And he said, I've never eaten any unclean thing. And the voice spake unto him again uh, the second time, What God has cleansed, that Call not thou common. Turn to the person next to you, and I mean it. Turn to the person next to you for a minute. <laughs> Say, I don't, know, I don't care what you've been through. You're clean. You're clean. <laughs> Look back at him and say, you don't know what I've been through, <laughs> but I'm clean. <laughs> in, church, in church, we, go, we, we get saved, and we go, I'm, I'm saved and sanctified, but I'm not sure about you. No, no, don't do that. What God cleanses, do not call unclean. Amen? Amen? Do not call what God cleanses unclean. We don't get anything out of this lesson 
be nice to people because God has already cleansed them. They're in church and you say, but I don't like the way they look. I don't, the way they, I don't like the way they talk. They have an accent or they don't have an accent. Their color is different than mine. They're taller than me. They're shorter. Who gives a hoot? But they're past. Who cares? If God's called them clean, by God, they're clean. Amen? Amen. And a voice spoke unto him again the second time what God has cleansed that that call not thou common. Well, you're not even common. You're blessed. This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. Now while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius' had made inquiry of Simon's house and stood before the gate. Simon's having this, this vision of these food, this unclean food, and he's going, I've never eaten this. You know, God's saying, eat it. He's going, I can't eat it. It's unclean. I've never eaten it. And God says, if I've caught it cleansed, it's cleansed. So he, what he's starting to do, God's saying, I'm bringing the unclean Gentiles into the kingdom of God, and you receive them. Amen? Amen. Okay, well, well, he doubted uh, in himself what this vision uh, which he had seen should mean. Behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquire of Simon's house and stood outside the gate and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, lodged there. While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. <clears throat> Arise, therefore, and get thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. This is a powerful story, man. The, the Samaritan half-breeds saw the guy who caused so much trouble, tongues and tongues, the Jews, tongues, spirit-filled, baptism of the Holy Spirit, and now the Gentiles. Then, then Peter went down, and Peter's looked upon as, uh, by some as the first pope. I just call him a good, a good uh, apostle, but he's highly regarded. And here, now he's going to the Gentiles. Remember how the apostles had to go down to the half-breeds, the Samaritans, and then the Holy Spirit came upon them, and God, brought, God said, I accept them. And now Peter's being sent over to the Gentiles. God's saying, I want you to know, I'll take the half-breeds, I'll take Saul, who caused so much trouble, and I'll take the Gentiles, and I'll bring them all into my family. That's a good story, isn't it? Yeah. And they said, uh, Cornelius, the centurion, a just man, and one, he's talk, uh, Peter's talking to these people that were sent, that feareth God of a good report among the nations of the Jews, was warned from God by a holy angel to send for thee into this house, and to hear words of thee. Then called he them in, and lodged there, and, an, and on the morrow, Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. Uh, the Jews. So this is Peter. Okay, here's Peter. He gets this vision. Father, I've never eaten anything unclean. God says, do not call what I call clean common. They're clean now. Okay, then all of a sudden, he hears there's three guys at the door. He goes down there. They're Gentiles. And they're going, we need you to come with us and talk to our, our, our master, who's a Gentile. In the Gentile area, Peter says, okay. And they leave the next day to go to the Gentile area. This is a powerful, powerful thing. Um, let's, let's drop down to verse 23. Acts 10, 23. Then called he them in and lodged them. He had them stay with them. And on the morrow he went away with them and a certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. He brought some Jews with him. He goes, I'm going with the, you look at, man, I'm white and we're going to a black neighborhood. I need some white guys with me. <laughs> I'm black and we're going to a white neighborhood. I want some, some black guys with me. You know how it is, you know. Oh, you're so holy you never thought those thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Peter is holy and he thought those thoughts. He said, I want some Jews going with me to the Gentiles. And on the morrow, after they entered into uh, Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them, and had called together his kinsmen and his near friends. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet, and he worshipped him, a Gentile worshipping a Jew. And Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. The house was full of a bunch of Gentiles. Here, this Jews coming to their house who would never come 
Jews would not step into a uh, uh, Gentile's house, just like they wouldn't step onto the Samaritan's land. And now Peter's walking in and is full of a bunch of Gentiles. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. In verse 28, and he said unto them, ye know how that it is a unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come into one another kingdom. But God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Turn to the person next to you and say, I don't care what color you are, you're a family member. Therefore, therefore, came a, therefore, I didn't ask you to marry him, I just asked you to say something to him. <laughs> Let me read on, please. Verse 29. Therefore came I unto you without a gainsaying, as soon as I was sent for. I asked, therefore, for what intent you have sent for me. Now listen, he says, why have you sent for me? And Cornelius said, four days ago I was fasting until the, this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing, and said, Cornelius, thy prayer has been answered, and thine alms are uh, had in the remembrance in the sight of God. Alms is a gift to the poor. Uh, verse 32, send therefore to Joppa, and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon the Tanner, by the seaside, beautiful place, like to be there right now, who, when he cometh, shall speak unto thee. Immediately, therefore, I sent for thee, and thou hast well done uh, that thou art come here. Now, therefore, are we all here pres present before God to hear all the things that are commanded of commanded thee of God. Wow. Now, can you, you talk about that? You're brought, he's brought into the Gentiles. He's he says, I'm not even supposed to be here. I hope you know that. It's unlawful for me to be here, but God just told me to come, so I'm here. Why am I here? He doesn't even know. He just knows that they came for him, and God told him to go. He says, well, an angel stood beside me and told me that my prayers was a memorial to God and my alms giving to the poor is a memorial to God, and that I was supposed to send for you. You're supposed to come here and speak to me. Now watch. Then Peter opened his mouth. And said of a truth, I perceive, perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word I say ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism of which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about healing all those that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. And we are witnesses, he says, and we are witnesses of the things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hung on a tree. How many know that they, they hung Jesus on a tree? Yeah, a cross. A cross was made of wood, wood is a tree. How God raised up the third day. How many know that Jesus was raised on the third day? And showed him openly. We know that he was openly walking around for several days. Not to all people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us. Who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that, this is what we're supposed to just do by the way that it is he which hath ordained, who was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. To him gave all prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth, please listen, Peter's actually preaching a gospel message. He says, I don't know why I'm here. They say, oh, you're here because I had this vision to talk to us. He says, well, okay, I'll tell you what I know about God. He's, I walked with Jesus. He healed all those that were oppressed of the devil. I saw him die on the cross. I saw him after he rose from the dead. And that's what the prophets always talked about, our prophets. It goes on. To him gave all prophets witness, and through his name, whosoever believeth in him. Can you imagine this Jew sitting there in a Gentile home? And whosoever believeth in him, Jesus was a Jew, 
if you Gentiles will believe in this Jewish Messiah, shall receive remission of sin. Now while Peter yet spoke these words, the Holy Ghost fell like on the day of Pentecost. And all them which heard the word, and they of the circumcision uh, which believed were astonished. The Jews that came with him, remember he, he, he was going into a white neighborhood, he wanted some black guys with him. He, he's, a, he's a white guy going into a black neighborhood, he wanted some white guys with him. He's a Jew going into a Gentile area, he needed some Jews with him. So he brought these Jews with him, and they're standing there, and all of a sudden, whew, the Holy Ghost falls on everybody, and they're amazed. They're going, look at this! Look! Look what's happening! So it's not just Peter there saying it's okay. Watch what happens. Verse 44. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word, and they of the circumcision, the Jews that came with, which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because why were they astonished? Because that on the Gentiles also poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. And they heard them. Everybody say heard them. Heard. Everybody say heard them. Heard. They heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. God's going, I'm going to put a stamp of approval. The Gentiles are brought in because I'm pouring out my Holy Spirit on them. And you Jews are going to see it because you were there and you, you guys... You were filled with the Holy Ghost and you spake in tongues. I'm going to show you the Holy Ghost is going to fall on them and they're going to receive the same gift. And they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized? Which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed he for them and he tarried several days. So uh, It's getting time so I have to close it. But what I'm trying to say is there's time after time in the Bible we see the baptism of the Holy Spirit and tongues. Paul had someone lay his, Ananias lay his hands on him because he was an ornery critter and God wants us all to know we've gone through ornery, stinky, rebellious, uprighteous, or we think we're righteous, uppity attitudes. And he says, I want you to know you humble your heart, I receive you in my family, and I'll fill you with the Holy Ghost. Amen. And you'll end up speaking in tongues more than them all, and your understanding may be unfruitful, but your spirit will bear a great. And I want the half-breeds, the Samaritans, I want them to know as I'm sending people there. And I'm going to, you watch. The apostles are going to go down, they're going to lay their hands on them, and they're going to pray in tongues. So much that Simon the sorcerer is going to pay. Give me that. Give me that power. And here the Gentiles. We'll never allow the Gentiles in our Jewish faith. No. He says, we're even going to send Peter, some thought the head of the church, down there. And Peter, I want you to preach. And while you speak, he didn't even lay his hands. He just spoke. And God did something. Now, Peter might have been a little reluctant to lay his Jewish hand on the Gentile head at first. But God said, I'm going to teach you something. And he just did it. And they started speaking in tongues. So is there a baptism of the Holy Spirit? On the day of Pentecost, there was. After there was, and there was, and there was. And was there speaking in tongues? Yes, yes, and yes. Amen? Amen. We're, we're out of time. There's so much more I want to cover. Next week, if we have time, I'd like to finish some of this. And then I want to talk to you about uh, you, you might want to remember this question because this bugged me so bad. I was taught in the church that I was raised that those who went to a Pentecostal church or those that prayed in tongues had received demons. And that, that talking, uh, talking in tongues was a chanting of a demon inside of them. So next week we're going to go into the Scripture and answer the question from the Bible, not just one place, several places, on what does the Bible say about that? Because I was reluctant to go forward as in Lester Summerall's church, and Brother Kenneth Hagin was there uh, speaking. If you don't know these guys, uh, some people might. And he was speaking, and he invited people up to receive the Holy Ghost. And I had a battle, because I was taught that that was of the devil. 
But I, the hunger inside me, I wanted it, and I had read. So I went forward, and they took me in a room, and they prayed for me. And I started to pray in an unknown language I never heard. But then afterwards, all that teaching got to me, and I started thinking, I made that up. It's of the devil. The devil got into me. And I went on a search again, went through scripture after scripture, Bible after Bible, trying to find out. I even made an appointment to see Brother Summer. I went back and talked to an elder of the church I was raised in, got a booklet from them. And so next week, we have time. I want to talk, answer the question, can you get an evil spirit when you're really seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Can you get an evil spirit when you're seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And we're going to go through the scriptures, and we're going to see that. Amen? Yeah, I can give you the answer right now, but I won't. I'll wait till next week. God, God bless you. Uh, I know it's a lot of reading tonight, but this is what we call teaching, and we have to get uh, line up on line, precept on precept, here a little, there a little, and that's what builds. Let me pray for you. Father God, in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, we thank you so much for your spirit. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you're here with us. And Heavenly Father, as we went through your word today, we're so thankful to you that you showed us that you bring Jews, you'd baptize them in the Holy Spirit, the evidence of speaking in tongues, you would bring in half-breeds, which several of us are, you would bring in people that even had come against your church and give them a chance, and even then use them and baptize them, and they'd speak more than anyone in tongues, and you showed us that even those who had no Jewish blood in them at all were brought in and received the same gift. So we thank you, Father. Today we thank you for Pentecost. And we thank you that Pentecost was just not for the Jews, but it was for the half-breeds, the Gentiles, and the wayward ones. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Uh, Rick's going to play some music. In front of you are the envelopes. This last Sunday we talked about giving, and uh, we may talk more about that but uh, in the future. But it is true. Uh, God, from the very beginning, set up a, a way for us to really become like him. He is such a giver. He gave us this world to live in. He gives us eternal life. He gave his son, Jesus Christ. He says, oh, I want to try to teach you to be like me, be a giver. And as you become a giver, he says, I'm going to give you incentive. You'll never outgive me. I'll always bless you when you give. I'll always take care of you. I'll always bless you when you give. And that's what he said. It's in his word. So I want to encourage you to give. Yes, yes, yes. I encourage you to give. I'm not one of those guys that talk a lot about giving, and people even uh, wonder why. Um, but I believe it. I believe it, and my wife and I do it. We believe that giving is important, and I want to encourage you to do the same thing. Amen? God bless you. The offering envelopes are in front of you. Uh, please go ahead and give, and you have a great day. And man, if you're a tongue talker and you've been stopped, you've, you stopped talking in tongues because you've been wondering, well, that's why I'm teaching this for you. Be more confident. Start praying in tongues. Slap the devil around. Don't let him in the world stop you. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you.